Thank you. I, I, I feel like there's a sense of unity now with everyone after the first one and then this panel. Um, so up next, we were supposed to have the debate between Gidi and Jeff, but partially my fault, Jeff and I went out drinking and he's on the way right now. Um, so instead, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Nick Zabo come up. <laughs> Nick, Nick's bit gold, although never uh, implemented, was a direct precursor to Bitcoin. Nick also developed the concept of smart contract uh, which has made him one of the most influential people in this industry. And I believe he planted the seeds and thoughts in so many people here and around the world. So, please welcome Nick. Thank you. Shalom Tel Aviv. So I'm going to talk about um, cryptocurrencies and some historical context, talk about early money and, and how that helped inspire cryptocurrency and what they have in common. And uh, So anyway, so I'm going to explain the... Uh, try to explain success of Bitcoin in terms of it it went from under $3 in 2011 to um, over $3,000 this year. And probably even more importantly, there's over 12,000 nodes um, there we go. <laughs> um, next. Um, over 12,000 or almost 12,000 nodes Worldwide, each one of these represents a full copy um, of the entire transaction history of the blockchain um, running live on the internet, so checking the work of other, other nodes. And so the, the original internet was designed to survive a nuclear war. Um, if that's still the case, then Bitcoin itself could survive a nuclear war because it, it, it's so redundant and could, any one of these could come back up and, and bring it back up if the rest got nuked. So um, it's, it's the most robust and probably the most secure financial infrastructure in the world now. Here, next. Um, so, and the rival, um, and, I, and I, I think of it as a rival experiment. Certainly Bitcoin um, is, a, is about a 10 year old experiment now. Um, but we have another experiment, it's really not that much older, it's a few decades old. Um, of digital centralization. And when we started out with computers, there were mainframes. This is an IBM, um, one of the early IBM computers in the upper left here, and it was based on an accounting machine. And so you had basically uh, a small group of programmers and accountants and managers who trusted each other in an office. And so the security of this was based on it. It was based on a bunch of, of people who worked together for a boss and trusted each other. And similarly, Unix here down on the lower left-hand side was designed with this um, kind of lax hierarchical security model in mind, where if you gain root access to Unix, you gain, you gain access to everything. And this worked well in, in you know, the small, cozy, mutually trusted offices where they worked. But does this work on a global scale for global infrastructure? And banks have added all sorts of strange attempts to try to uh, try to add some security and redundancy to what financially is a very weak model of digital centralization um, with I think some mixed success. But, and even when they do that, the basic problem is they're still centrally controlled and so that it's a source of political pressure and legal pressure and so on, which I'll get into um, next. So the pr I'm gonna go take a trip backwards through history now. So that's the most recent um, mainstream, some people call that traditional finance. It's really, a, digital centralization is really a radical experiment in finance and it's piled on top of another radical experiment in finance which occurred during the 20th century and that's fiat currency. So if this is the United States dollar, um, on the bottom here is, is the current status, legal tender, um, not redeemable for anything, not an IOU. 
But not too long ago, um, back here in 1934, it was an IOU. In fact, technically up till 1970, it was an IOU redeemable for gold. Um, here it says redeemable for lawful money. Um, and then the original one back in 1928, before the start of the Great Depression, um, redeemable for gold on demand. And so this is in fact how our, our banknotes that some of us still have in our pockets today um, originated. They were IOUs for gold. So, next. Going back in time a little more, what were they redeemable for? They were, what did people want at the end of the day? They wanted a trust minimized currency. So an IOU is not trust minimized. I'm trusting somebody will pay that debt back. Um, but at the end of the day, people wanted the actual thing back. So what is it they wanted back that was a trust minimized currency? Um, this shows the, the silver network, the global silver network that occurred after the Spanish conquests um, in Mexico and Peru. And so from the conquest and from the mining bonanzas of silver and gold that occurred, there was these worldwide ne networks of, of silver coming out. So what was this silver turned into? Well, on the top right-hand side here, we have an ingot that would have been the normal form for shipping it across, across the oceans for the Spanish. Um, then we have it being minted into coins, um, the, the precursor of our dollar in the United States. Um, and, but different cultures did different things, different legal traditions did different things. So in the Indian Ocean, they turned this silver into what's called a silver lair, and it's a wire money. You could snip this money at, at various points to get the weight you wanted, and you could also hold it over a fire and see the color it glowed to do a kind of, of low-tech primitive spectroscopy and see if that was genuine silver or not. And then in China, we had Sai Si ingots were, were a common form uh, that this was turned into. So there's a common globally seamless money, the silver here, but uh, turned into various local forms. Next. And so uh, you can distinguish between metal and its form. It could be in the form of jewelry, be formed in the coins, could be in the form of ingots. So this is a, uh, a silver treasure trove unearthed in Scotland, and it's got jewelry in it, and coins, and ingots. But what they have in common, so they have all these different forms, some of which people would now call jewelry, and would now call money, but really what they have in common is they're all silver, and so they're made out of this globally seamless uh, form of money. Um, next. Um, so, if we go back to ancient Mesopotamia, this is before the invention of coinage, um, this tablet is instructing, it's a legal, it's a list of legal penalties, and the legal penalties, the most common legal to penalty is to weigh and deliver a certain standard weight of silver. And so this is 1400 years before the invention of coinage, and this is one of the forms of silver could take of these um, spirals that, again, you could snip in, in various places to get the length and weight you want, and also easy, easy to, uh, to see its purity as well. So this is 1,400 years before, before the invention of coinage. Next. And, um, of course, this region itself has a, has a great tradition of this. Um, since the Bible is one of the earliest written records of these that dates before the invention of coinage. Um, there's a lot of good evidence for this here. And so here's some silver ingots. This is what's called hack money. It's very flat. You can hack it up into different pieces um, depending on, on how much you want to pay. And so this is used in currency in the Holy Land at the time of Jeremiah. And there's also some jewelry here. A lot of the jewelry was deliberately molded to have certain standard weights. Um, so that shows you it's, it's functioning as something more than, more than what we today call just jewelry. Next. And this is a tax collector's silver cache, or at least it's believed that that's the archaeological interpretation. Again, we have lumps and ingots, um, some flat hack silver, and some uh, broken up jewelry, which shows they're, they're, they're collecting this stuff for its silver content, not, not for any artistic form or for the picture of a king on a coin or anything like that. And again, this dates before coinage. Um, this is from what is believed to be a, an ancient 
Levitical city called Eshtemoa, um, which I think is about eight miles south of Hebron. Next. And so what were these used for? Well, among the most common things listed are uh, purchasing land. So Abraham, I guess this is fairly um, famous in Israel now. Um, Abraham's purchase of the, uh, uh, from Ephron of, of some land for weight current among the merchants. So again, they're talking about specific weights. Abraham, it's unlikely he's paying a tablet that says IOU, you know, so much silver, good at this bank or something. He's weighing out specific silver and paying. And uh, similarly, when, and whenever shekels are mentioned, that's a unit of weight. And in fact, we have shekels, drachma, pounds, um, pesos, etc. Those all originated as units of weight. They're, they're being used as units of fiat currency now, but their origin is they were units of weight. And the, the standard of value was the uh, standard units of weight of, of gold or silver. Um, and again, weighed out the money. So they're, they're paying, they're not just paying IOUs in silver, they're paying specific silver. Weighing and delivering it. Next. Um, and of course, since the Bible is a religious book, there are, there are lots of temple offerings in there as well, but this is an example. And again, they're, they're not giving the temple IOUs either. This is, a, this is like the king and his retinue giving a bunch, so they're giving gold, which is, is of course, the more valuable wealth transfer medium. And they're weighing it out. They're, just because there's a king in the temple don't, doesn't mean they, they trust each other with IOUs. Um, next. Um, so we can go back even farther. Um, well, this is, this is a, a view of the medieval Silk Road, but this is a very ancient, ancient set of trade routes that, that dates way back into prehistory. And next. And what this tells you also is social scale. Um, you could trade all the way from Europe to China goods like silk, for example. You didn't know the people, you didn't have any reason to trust them, but there was a set of trust minimized steps all the way across that allowed this economic system to socially scale all the way across this vast continent. Now these are cowrie shells that originated from the Red Sea in Egypt, next to Egypt, and um, made their way all the way to China, and they actually become more common as you get towards the Pacific Ocean coast of China and, and the river valleys. So they're being transported all this way, and this is a very common, common pattern for shell collectibles and money, being transported all the way from the other side of this huge continent, um, which makes them all the more scarce and, and therefore valuable. Um, unaffordable costliness. Thanks. And the most common, um, before precious metals, the most common, there, were, there was a wide variety of things used as media of exchange, media of wealth transfer and store of value. The most common was um, shells, and so these are a wide variety of, of shells, but they're all made from the same biological crystal of calcium carbonate, which has a very good properties of durability and makes it great for, for collectibles and money. Next. And so, um, and we can see this in the, uh, the metals, too. There's no coincidence the monetary metals, copper, silver, and gold, sit on top of each other in the periodic table. This is no coincidence. They have the same electron cloud, very similar electron cloud structure, very similar chemical properties, and this gives them very similar properties of durability and so forth that are desirable for a, media, a store of value and a medium of wealth transfer and trust minimized. Um, so, like any other modern institution or technology, there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. Good ways, bad ways to deliver it, good and bad designs for it, good and bad technologies to use, and it doesn't have to be good at anything else. Your, your goal doesn't have to be a good electricity conductor, nobody cared about that um, before modern times. Um, your calcium carbonate doesn't really have to be useful as anything else. It, it can be specialized as this stuff. Next. Um, so, one of the th lessons we can learn from that is that um, trust scales poorly. People in Europe are not acquiring silks from China because they tr know and trust the people in China. They have no idea they, where this stuff is coming from, really. Um, 
They're doing that because it's a great quality thing that they can buy from the next guy over, the Arab traders, um, Byzantine traders, Hebrew traders, so forth, um, that are the next state, that are on the stage in between um, Europe and, and further east in the continent of Eurasia. Um, so trust scales poorly. Trust is a, is a personal thing. Um, the more you can know a person, the more you can know what you can trust them with and what you can't. Um, modern society has developed a whole bunch of institutions like advertising, marketing, um, kind of on the positive spin side and on the negative side, um, law enforcement, armed forces, other kinds of security um, legal systems to uh, get strangers and people who don't know each other so well to cooperate. So we live in a society where we don't know each other as well as traditional societies did. Um, and some things can function at that scale and some things can't. So this is a, uh, a, a sketch of some of the, oh, n sorry, back. Um, this is a sketch of some of the uh, um, attacks that have happened in the Bitcoin um, ecosystem. And just about all of them have occurred at the, on the centralized exchanges and other centralized entities that sit around Bitcoin and make it kind of user friendlier for people um, and convenient. But they're also the, the main source of insecurity. Bitcoin itself, there's only one um, attack been on it um, called, take advantage of a thing called the Border Gateway Protocol, which is a kind of a semi-centralized part of the internet. Um, so even the attack that was successful against Bitcoin um, was an attack that took advantage of the insecurity of centralization. Next. And trusted third parties, besides being security holes, are also lawyer magnets. Um, so you can go on Twitter and other things and watch lawyers threaten people. <laughs> and they're threatening exchanges. They're not you know, threatening Bitcoin itself. Um, who are you going to sue? Um, it's, they're threatening the exchanges because they're centralized entities you can go after. Next. Um, so cryptocurrency, so now I'm gonna, I took the trip back through history. Um, I'm popping back up now to, to about 10 years ago. Well, no, um, 20 years ago. <laughs> um, and some of the origins of cryptocurrency. Um, so trust minimization was, was kind of for myself, and I think this was um, at least implicitly um, throughout cypherpunks and, and to some extent the cryptography research community, um, was the value of trust minimization. We should design our protocols um, to minimize vulnerabilities to all the parties to each other, outsiders, insiders, infrastructure providers, counterparties, third parties. Um, the normal capitalist business model is um, we have this centralized structure, we trust ourselves, everybody should trust us. And that works well for things like making lots of widgets. Um, it does not, I think, work so well in the, in the world of digital finance. And so that's one of the big big debates because mainstream finance, as it is now, is engaged in this um, experiment that says, well, everybody can trust us. Even though they don't know us, we're a bunch of strangers in a different city, um, you gotta trust us. And so Bitcoin comes with a very different model. Next. Um, of trust minimization. And so there was also a very um, libertarian um, set of inspirations um, for people like Wei Dai and myself um, with the first cryptocurrency designs. Um, so we wanted to apply computer science to solve ambitious, I guess, ambitious libertarian problems. So this is Ayn Rand on the left here. She came up with the idea of Galt's Gulch where there was kind of this um, science fiction force field that protected this um, libertarian utopia from government oppression. And well, we don't have force fields in the real world, but what Tim May, one of the co-founders of the Cypherpunks, uh, figured out is encryption could be a good tool to create this kind of um, force field around ourselves, a mathematically, astronomically strong force field between um, people who wanted to engage in free transactions and people who wanted to come in and course them. So that was a kind of uh, a, a perhaps more achievable libertarian um, goal. Um, and Frederick Hayek here on the left, um, and there's also Ludwig von Mises and others 
um, and Marie Rothbard and so forth, who were inspirational from the Austrian um, school, um, talked about privatizing money, but they also talked about the importance of secure property rights and secure contract rights, which um, I think uh, Ayn Rand and Tim May a bit papered over in, in their accounts. Um, so out of this, though, thinking about how can we really achieve this, uh, and some people said, oh, it's just a matter of dogma, you know, you can make this work and we can achieve this. Um, I kind of approached it and said, well, we can't achieve it yet, but we have all this great capability of, of the vast um, improvements in computational resources that are available um, due to Moore's law and so forth, and we have this computer science, so can we apply this to come up with uh, smart contracts, um, contracts where instead of being enforced coercively, um, they are incentivized by collateral and by security protocol, um, blockchains and cryptocurrency. So. Smart contracts is a whole other different talk. Um, today I'm focusing on cryptocurrency. Next. Um, so, brief uh, history of cryptocurrency and blockchain tech here. Um, this is David Chaum, one of our inspirations, and uh, Ralph Merkel. And so it comes out of uh, public key cryptography, which was, uh, I guess, rediscovered and made known to the public in the 1970s. Um, and Ralph Merkel was one of the pioneers there, and Mer Ralph also came up with Merkle trees, which is a um, you know secure hash structure. It's very fundamental to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally, and secure timestamping was the extension was an extension of that. Um, so, and of course, um, digital cash. David Chaum. Now this was I think mainly intended as a uh, payment system, and rather than a new kind of currency and it was centralized. The focus of that was privacy. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about, about re-adding privacy to uh, decentralized cryptocurrencies. And Byzantine Consensus by Leslie M. Lamb, Poor and others. Um, smart Contracts um, and Probabilistic Byzantine Consensus. And tho those Byzantine Consensus got, got improved, which I'll talk about. Next. Um, so public blockchains, decentralized through computer science, so this is a, a kind of conceptual um, thing that shows you the, the kind of savings that can be achieved. If a traditional financial institution relies on accountants, um, police officers and investigators, lawyers, and so forth for its security, for a lot of its security, whereas blockchain integrity, whereas blockchains um, automate that for specific functions like, like issuing money. Um, so, you can think of it as a bunch of robots, accountants in green eye shades, talking to each other um, in robot language and, and uh, checking each other's work. So, that, that's certainly not a computer science definition of it, but, but a, a kind of metaphor for, for high-level understanding of it. And uh, this is the resources we took it, can take advantage of. This is Moore's Law. It's many, Many orders of magnitude improvement, human capability, those accountants and lawyers and police officers, their brains are the same size they've always been. Um, computers are, are millions of times more powerful um, than they were than in the beginning of the mainframe um, era. Next. Um, so, um, in terms of the we had some toy and, and centralized private currencies in Digicash and PayPal basically to just test out, test out the system. So kind of also putting the idea into our heads, but really couldn't be done seriously as a centralized thing. And um, Digicash, for example, is going to be based off bank accounts and, and fiat currency. But we actually had a, a toy currency as a, as a beta test. And secure property titles. Um, and, and BitGold, um, secure property titles are now called tokens. Um, I guess tokens is, a, is a, a somewhat understated way of saying what they are, and security property titles may be overstated. But uh, um, those are two things I came up with in 1998, um, combining Merkle trees with probabilistic Byzantine consensus. Um, there's a train of transactions. I did not have blocks in there, so you chain with no blocks. <laughs> and uh, 
a, out of that, a cryptocurrency called Bitcold, one of the uh, secure property titles was titles to unforgeably costly bits um, based on proof of work. Thank you. Now, so now greatly improved over that, incorporating the proof of work to help secure the consensus, which is a great improvement over Byzantine consensus. Um, and combining transactions into blocks are among the innovations of Bitcoin. And of course, actually writing the software and putting it out there, which uh, Satoshi about 10 years ago made a huge difference, turning like theory and, and daydreaming into reality. So, um, and Ethereum, um, bringing Turing complete smart contracts to it, privacy coins, uh, Monero, Dash, and Zcash. So that's bringing back some what da David Chaum was trying to achieve with, with digital cash into um, decentralized um, consensus cryptocurrency. Um, and a another interesting thing that's a work in progress right now that may be promising are DAG chains. Next. And so Bitcoin has um, took the traditional spent list, which was in DigiCash and most of these other uh, centralized digital cash things. Um, and so it's vulnerable to a small group of strangers. Our little toy currency, you know, any one of us programmers with root access to the computer could have come along and change anybody's account balance. Um, so the solution for uh, consensus, um, make a consensus out of and decentralize, replicate the transaction history around. Um, so Bitgold was based on Byzantine consensus. And uh, Bitcoin greatly improved on that. It was based on Nakamoto consensus, to, for lack of a better term, which is incorporating the proof of work as part of that consensus. And the, the weakness of Byzantine consensus, which unfortunately I think some people in the crypto business still don't understand, is that it's subject to Sybil attacks. You have to strongly identify the nodes. Um, identification is a very weak um, local human institution. And so that, that's a severe weakness in bureaucracy. It also makes it permission so that um, you have to get some central authority's permission typically to join the network and be a miner. Um, whereas Bitcoin, Nakamoto consensus, it's permissionless for miners to join. Um, and it's anonymous and probabilistic. Identity is not required for miners. It's not required for anybody. It's based on computational strength. And that's a big part of what makes Bitcoin and similar things uh, uh, globally seamless, is they're not re relying on any particular local institution. Um, so secure property titles go out into that in more detail. Again, this is what we now call tokens. Um, it's a secure distributed title database to prevent destruction of titles or tokens. Um, so it makes the transfer um, really trust minimized, um, enforced entirely by protocol, globally seamless. And the idea, give us public records that will survive a nuclear war. Next. And so Bitgold is based on that, based on um, what was I then called secure property titles. And the idea is to combine that trust minimization of gold or silver, which I'd learned about by, by studying um, the early monetary history, um, with the convenience of digital money, so by applying computer science. So tokens based on proof of work and securely decentralized based on Byzantine consensus and Merkle trees, and a money supply limited by mining costs. Now, in a way, Bitgold may actually have a more secure um, money supply limitation than Bitcoin and, and current cryptocurrencies do because it's based on mining costs and markets uh, rather than by um, a software parameter that can be changed by fork. Um, on the other hand, it had some weaknesses too, some of which I already pointed out, the, the Sybil attack possibility um, and the weakness of Byzantine. And also that it depends on markets and markets typically to be efficient have been centralized. Hopefully that won't be true so much in the future. We'll have decentralized exchanges but that, that certainly has been, has been a, a major weakness of the Bitgold design. Um, yeah, next. 
And so that's just a little more description of what BitGold was, timestamp hash collisions, um, more part portable and secure than gold. And I, I should have mentioned that while gold and, and silver were, were a nice globally seamless form of money, um, they were also fairly insecure. So the, the uh, Aztecs would collect tribute from the various uh, Native American tribes. Um, the Spanish came and looted the Aztecs. The English pirates came and looted the Spanish and uh, so forth. So that was not, not as secure as I think we can make Bitcoin with good key management um, and other good cryptocurrencies with good key management be today. And this, um, probably most of you are all familiar with, this is the, uh, the Merkle tree in Bitcoin that provides a big part of its integrity. So at the bottom, you have the chain of, of blocks, and each block has in it a, a Merkle tree. Next. And a chain of transactions. So this part was also in uh, secure property titles. And it's basically you sign a transaction with your digital signature that that tells the system that the next person on owns it, owns that value. Next. Next. Okay. Um, so now you can think proof of work is is a mining. I think it's a metaphor that that I invented. Some people like it. Some people hate it. Um, if you don't like mining, you might think of it as uh, rare stamp collecting. Rare stamp collectors do all this work to uh, find these rare errors in stamps. And then, because they found this rare error, you know it's a very rare thing. Um, there's a secure supply curve. And so that serves the similar purpose to, you know, gold is rare, you know, silver is rare, and you know, um, Bitcoin hash collisions are rare. Um, now, Bitcoin has taken a bunch of hash collisions with different scarcity values and kind of made them fungible. Um, Bitgold actually said they're not fungible and we need this extra step of market to make it fungible. But there's always, if, if for some reason um, that breaks down, Bitcoin can always convert into Bitgold. So its supply curve remains secure, but it, it, it would take a different form. Next. And so just to uh, put a high-level metaphor on what's the differences between a traditional centralized database and an immutable blockchain such as Bitcoin, um, the traditional database is like Etch-a-Sketch. That local administrator that was trusted in that cozy office can come along and, and change the records. Um, and if they're clever, do it, do it without de um, reliable detection. Um, an immutable blockchain, you can't do that. It's like flies trapped in amber. Once they're there, it's very, very costly to try to change it. Next. Um, so the technical money problem that Bitcoin solves, that um, the authenticity of money, it's not, money is not counterfeit. Um, the scarcity of supply, which I talked about, um, and that there's no double spending. So double spending is a problem that you take for granted. can't happen with physical beans, coins, paper notes, etc. Although you, you can copy paper notes, so there, there is the counterfeiting um, issue there. Um, but it's trivially easy to copy digital things. So the traditional answer is a spent list, um, a centralized spent list and the transact decentralized transaction history of a Bitgold or a Bitcoin um, solves that problem in a more robust, trust-minimized manner. Next. Um, so now let's talk about digitally centralized fiat currencies, which are, are the, the big competition. Um, so what Bitcoin and other good cryptocurrencies provide you is a strong, trust-minimized integrity that's independent of financial institutions. Um, so again, like the gold itself or the silver itself. Um, seamlessly operates across borders and can serve as a store of value or medium of exchange as opposed to, I'm going to talk about the digitally centralized fiat currencies are becoming less good as a medium of exchange and more medium of political control. As, as kind of the political actors discover what they can do with it. 
And so now I'm going to talk about Bitcoin applications a bit. Um, um, layer one, the, uh, the, the main capital B Bitcoin on the blockchain itself, um, of course, is a store of value. Um, it's, 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 of course, somewhat volatile, being these are the early, early years, early decades of uh, this new thing. I imagine when gold first appeared in the Danube Valley uh, about 6,000 years ago, um, people would not have known how valuable that was versus shells, and there would have been a lot of different opinions about it. They didn't have markets to put prices on it, but if they had, they likely would have been very volatile as well because there's a long, long uh, stretch of uncertainty till we figure out um, how things are going to settle out. So, store value, but but because it's designed um, with this trust to minimize money supply, it does make a much better long-term store of value than, than fiat currencies. Um, Cross-border um, business to business or just various large value uh, cross-border transactions. Um, remittances, um, routing around capital controls. Of course, there's been various controversial and illegal things as, as initial markets for this thing. Um, things, that, things that are forbidden by blacklist, that'll get you blacklisted um, from the banking, from your bank account, of course, are going to be natural early, early adopters of cryptocurrencies. And that's not at all a function of um, its use as money. That means it's superior money. Um, it's just that that use tends to be the uh, early use an early use of superior money. Um, and a reserve currency secure against war and political distrust. So I think in the future, some, kind, some banks and central banks will get interested in it. It will likely not be in the most developed areas or the most secure areas of the world. It will be in places like the Ukraine, um, various places where the gold is, is physically insecure. It's under physical threat. Um, and those will likely be places that, with, with some good key management, Bitcoin can make a much more secure reserve currency, and it's also trust minimized. You're not holding as reserves, you know, the bonds of some foreign government that, you know, could renege on their bonds because they hate you in the future. They might decide they hate you and renege on their bonds. Um, can't do that with, with good cryptocurrency. And then kind of what more people, popular people popularly think of of money is buying the pizza and the coffee and so forth, that's really gonna migrate to layer two. Um, and I'll talk about a little more about layer two um, in a bit. Um, right now I'll just talk a little bit more about um, digital centralization. So we have this creeping, creeping political control. Um, I, I haven't seen good statistics on it, but certainly anecdotally over the last, um, several decades as, as more political actors have discovered the vulnerability of digital centralization as a locus of control where political activists, um, regulators, law enforcers, um, anybody who wants to control what other people are doing with their money, freeze their money, take away their money. Um, these are honeypots. These are honeypots for that, that kind of control over other people's money. And so it makes money less secure for people. It makes it less usable as a medium of exchange if it can be frozen as a store of value. Um, but it's, it's vulnerable to this. There isn't really much banks can do about that other than, other than uh, lobby for their customers. But um, since they're also institutions that don't really know their customers personally, by and large, um, they're really more incentivized to um, usually to give in to the political activists rather than um, try to make life better for their customers. And so we have money is, this digitally central money is, is becoming less useful for more and more people and that re creates a, a natural um, early market for, for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Next. Um, so the more widely trusted a third party is, the more it attracts motivated political activism, trying to regulate behavior directly or indirectly, 
and attacking political enemies. Next. Um, and so another Bitcoin application um, is areas where there's poorly run fiat currencies. And the left here is the German Weimar hyperinflation of the 1920s um, when, when the money got reduced um, to being playthings for children. And uh, this is a, a look at the local Bitcoin's volume in Venezuela. Um, it's been exponentially skyrocketing. It's still exponentially skyrocketing. It's off, off the page here basically now. Um, and that is because both due to the hyperinflation in Venezuela and due to, due to obviously people wanting a more secure store of value. If you get paid and then you have to go spend it immediately, regardless of whether the store has really what you really want to buy or not, you have to go spend it immediately, otherwise it becomes worth much, much less in the course of just a week or two. Um, so people um, in Venezuela are searching for alternatives. Some people are, are mining their own Bitcoin. People are using a lot more gold and silver than they used to. Um, when you wreck the fiat currency, the, the, uh, the more promising uh, trust minimized ones come to the fore. Um, so blockchain scaling has been a, a big controversial issue of the last few years. Um, and fortunately, the, uh, the security, the people who wanted the stronger security went out, which I think is a great thing, um, in the Bitcoin at least, because uh, social scalability is much more important than, than computational scalability. Um, social scalability is that global seamlessness, that ability of somebody in Albania to pay somebody in Zimbabwe, um, somebody in Israel to pay somebody in Iceland, and you don't have to trust somebody in New York City or London or, or Berlin or Frankfurt or so forth um, with your, uh, that transaction. Um, and so what certainly Bitcoin and I think the good cryptocurrencies have done is they sacrifice computational resources and scalability in order to achieve this global seamlessness. Um, through proof of work, which is of course very expensive, people complain about the electricity and they're constantly trying to come up with alternatives but the alternatives turn out um, to add trust. And when you add trust, that adds a huge potential amount of social cost and risks, which um, is going to make, make things um, costlier and more bureaucratic, more local. Um, and broadcast replication, um, which again is very expensive. You're making you know, thousands and thousands of, of copies of this stuff. And why are you doing it? So it's globally robust and seamless. There's no place that an attacker can go um, and bring down the uh, system. And so it's that strong security, the good computer science that makes Bitcoin socially scalable. It makes it seamlessly global, um, securely permissionless, and censorship resistant. So it, uh, by and large, achieves, and certainly goal, goal when I was designing Bitcoin is to achieve um, that global seamlessness, that, that gold and silver um, as, as units of weight and purity of, of metal achieve that trust minimization, that global seamlessness, but in a digital medium, which is, is much less costly and, and at least potentially much more secure for the users. Next. And so some second layer stuff. Uh, peripheral, I call, like to call them peripheral financial networks. If you think about a core and, and a periphery, a core being core blockchain and a periphery. Uh, the more common um, thing is to call them second layers. Um, now, when I designed Bitcold, I was using David Chaum's um, digital cash as a second layer. That was going to be the retail layer. That's what people would normally um, pay for their coffee and pizza in um, with, with the privacy features of that. Um, but that was based on a centralized, trusted third party. And so now we can do much better than that um, with things like Lightning, um, Sprite and Raiden, and Plasma for Ethereum, and, and so forth. Um, we can achieve a great degree of trust minimization um, using smart contract techniques, such as holding 100% collateral, um, to establish collateralized payment channels. And thus, you can use the pay much cheaper payment channel instead of on-chain stuff for your transactions and then net settle after um, a fairly long period of time 
once the system is mature next. And so Lightning, the Lightning network for Bitcoin is growing quite substantially as what was in January of last year. And this is uh, next. What it is, um, what it has been in October, and then it's grown quite a bit more since then. Next. Um, so there's also commercial vendor tools such as BTC Pay is an open source e-commerce um, server that works over Lightning Bitcoin or directly over Bitcoin. Um, and there is Puro Shards Excel plugin um, to pay Bitcoin and Lightning and automatically update your Excel books. Um, so that's, that's great for small businesses and people who want to keep track of, of what they've been doing for tax purposes and so forth. Um, it's very, very strongly recommended if you're keeping track of all your capital gains and stuff, even though you're making small payments. Um, next. Um, so phases of Bitcoin value transfer. So as, as a result of this kind of technological back and forth, um, Bitcoin started out as just a small value, small scale project. Um, 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas was, was the exchange rate. You couldn't, there was no central ex price quoted exchange uh, back then. Um, and that was on the blockchain. So that, that got some people um, accustomed to the idea that, well, just layer one itself should be used for all our day to day transactions. But unfortunately, that doesn't computationally scale, and we don't want to sacrifice security or trust minimization to make that computationally scale because that'll, that'll ruin the global seamlessness and the censorship resistance and all that other, other great stuff. So uh, more recently, as the value's gone up, um, the fees have gone up, um, and larger value transactions. And that's probably the trend for the future. Yeah, assuming the, the price goes up more, then the, the transaction fees will be going up more as well. Um, but the small value transactions are gonna start to happen at layer two with that lightning, lightning network on Bitcoin, for example. Um, and the, uh, the blockchain itself will be reserved for, for higher value transactions that are willing to pay the higher fees. Next. And that gives you the best of both worlds. That gives you the retail, um, coffee and, and pizza and so forth and that gives you the globally seamless, trust-minimized, censorship-resistant um, store of value. Now there's some other strategies out there. These are based on what BitGold was based on, which is Byzantine consensus, and well, most of these are. I, I'm not gonna speak for all of them, but um, they're based on identified nodes and some other, um, sometimes some other centralized features like the, uh, the arbitration and the reversal of transactions that happens in EOS. But as a result, these are far from trust minimized. There's somebody um, with some Anglo-Saxon name living presumably in, I don't know, New York City or somewhere, but uh, I don't know them. The vast majority of people using EOS don't know them, but they can reverse your transactions um, according to some, some sort of evolving common law. Um, so now, of course, this has features insofar as you know, somebody cheats you or something, you can put it up through arbitration, get it reversed. But this is a human global bureaucracy. These are basically trying to replicate what lawyers and accountants and law enforcement officers have been doing for many, many years. Um, and, and doing that at, at the protocol layer instead of higher up. And so the result is they're gonna have high governance costs. They're not gonna be um, globally seamless after a while. Um, lots of legal disputes and, and poor social scalability in general. Next. Now, something I think is very interesting because it um, combines basically the goal that, that my old boss, David Chaum, was trying to achieve with uh, decentralized replicated cryptocurrencies. And one of these is Monero. It's been fairly successful. Um, ring signatures with confidential transactions. And another one is um, next. Another one is uh, Zcash, another one of uh, David Chown's former employees, Zuko. Um, Wilcox um, was one of the founders of this. And using zero knowledge proofs and some uh, related techniques to uh, achieve privacy in a decentralized cryptocurrency. Next. 
And so next. Um, in conclusion, um, we have this global um, trust minimized seamless cryptocurrency. So what are the, some of the things to watch out for? What, what might this end up being used for over the next few years and next decade? Um, and one of them, and I, I think might, might surprise uh, people, is that while banks and central banks don't want their customers touching us because they want to have control over their money, um, there's going to be some situations um, where a central bank can't trust a, a foreign central bank or a foreign government with, with their bonds, for example. Um, and so one solution that has been performed is to have the Swiss government hold it for you because everybody supposedly trusts the Swiss government. Um, but that's, a, that's not a trust minimized solution. Um, the Swiss government itself is, is vulnerable to political um, pressure from various quarters. And so a more trust minimized solution is, is cryptocurrency, to hold some of your central bank reserves in cryptocurrency. And if you have good key management, the other problem with, um, with gold reserves is that they're physically vulnerable. When the Nazis conquered Europe in World War II, the first place they went when they, when they conquered a capital city of another country is the gold vault of the central bank. Um, those are, those belong to the right now. So um, that, that's, a, that's a very suboptimal solution to your, your um, what you would hope would be trust minimized secure reserves. Um, and you can do a lot better with, with cryptocurrency in that regard. So for any um, government or central bank that's under that kind of physical threat, maybe for example Ukraine, um, various parts of the world, um, cryptocurrency is going to become an increasingly um, attractive option for that as the technology matures. Um, now for, for the rest of us, um, various people in places like Venezuela, Argentina, Nigeria, and so forth, Hedging against hyperinflation, um, which is a, is a perpetual problem in many of these places. Um, Cross-border payments, uh, capital flight, and routing around political blacklists. So those are, those are already some of the main uses of cryptocurrency and will look both for um, the various people who don't want this to happen to uh, try to crack down on it and on the other hand, um, increased use for that, these purposes. Um, and growth of second layer networks like Lightning, which will be, allow the more familiar uh, purchasing um, restaurant meals, pizzas, and coffee, et cetera. And so that uh, concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much, appreciate it.